Good evening everyone. How's it going? Long break. How's it going? Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, Anand, how are you? I'm good, Sagar. How are you doing? Yeah, good weekend. The voice is breaking. Oh man, again. <clears throat> Just a minute. Now, is it better? Yep. Okay. How's it going everybody? Everybody's silent. Nobody wants to talk. Okay. So, what we covered up so far, um, a couple of things, a lot of things. We, we, this is the fifth day, I believe. So we did speak about the very basics of hardware, operating systems, a um, couple of networking concepts, what is a public IP, what is a private IP, certain things about virtualization concepts, what is a type 1 hypervisor, what is a type 2 hypervisor, why do you need virtualization, how it's going to cut down the cost. So such things is what we spoke about. Um, the certain homework that I also gave okay voice is breaking um, okay Okay, you may be better now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, I was um, just recapping what we did in the last week. So, this is the second week where we'll be doing certain concepts on AWS today um, so so what we covered last week was we started with operating systems uh, very basics of that what is a client operating system what is a server operating system um, why do we use that the basics of networking um, certain virtualization concepts IP addressing concepts um, uh, what is a type 1 hypervisor what is a type 2 hypervisor? Then I gave you certain uh, examples of those where you can install VMware Workstation or you can also install um, VirtualBox, right? Um, on certain videos, I also showed about um, registry, what registry is. So um, you will follow along with me only if you're doing all your homeworks. You will be lost if you do not do the homework. So it's all your, it's all in your hands how much of understanding that you want to have. Um, routers, switches, firewalls, um, all those things are also important. So I hope uh, you've done some of those virtualization things. No, yes.
Okay. If you have no, no questions, I mean, the, the, the blank space was only for your questions. If you have no questions, we'll move forward. Yeah? If there are no questions, I assume that you know everything. Yeah, Anand, the, the last week task, uh, so we need, uh, we need to install VirtualBox, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I did it. Like, uh, So we installed the VirtualBox. So apart from, I have the AWS account too. Awesome. Everybody has an AWS account? Yeah. Or rather, who doesn't have an AWS account? Hi, my name is Lakshmi. Hi. I don't have AWS service. You do not have an AWS, and this is your first class. Yes. Okay. So. Um, What's your technical background, if I have to know, just about a minute? Um, what's your technical background, Lakshmi? I just completed BSc Computers. Okay. Do you know what IP addresses are, what's a private IP, subnet mask, etc.? No. Yes or no? No. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I, I suggest that we uh, go ahead and uh, create an AWS account. Um, how about others? Shanti and Shilpa? Have you, have you created an AWS account? Uh, yes, I did create it. Sorry? Uh, I didn't have a, a account on the account, AWS. Okay, you already had it. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So, assuming that everybody has an AWS account now, um, Lakshmi, you need to create your account yourself. You gotta go to aws.amazon.com here on this website, like you see on the screen. Let's go to aws.amazon.com. There, you will see a button, create a free account, and um, create a free tier account for yourself. <clears throat> Yeah, let's go here, uh, my account, and then say AWS console, or maybe there, there will be a button to create an account for yourself. Once you have it, you'll sign in and see a similar screen like this. Yeah, okay. Uh, before we dive into AWS, I'm going to talk about certain networking concepts, some more which are important for networking, in especially, specifically VPC. Now, as you know, that IP address is an Octet, it has four octets, right? Just to give you an example of an IP address, the 192.168.30.5 is is um, um, is a format of an IPv4 address. Yeah, is a format of IPv4. So if you look at command prompt and do IP config on your laptop or desktop or wherever, and you're gonna see the IP address that is assigned to you. You're familiar with this command, isn't it? IP config has been done that several times. For Lakshmi, I would suggest that you look at the recordings that are there. Um, I'll share them with you. So <clears throat> please give me your email address on the chat separately. So um, I suggest that you look at all the videos. Um, and that way it will be more understandable for you. <clears throat> so um, this is a format of an IP address, 192.168.43.7. So if you look at this, um, no, I'll, I'll just split that up. Uh, let's say you, even you see the subnet mask, isn't it? 255.255.255.0, right? I'm going to put that over here. So <clears throat> the machine next to me, the machine next to me will be 192.168.30.10. The machine next to that one will be 192.168.30.30.0. So this way, you, what, what you will notice, what's common in between these IP addresses is that um, the first part, the first part is always a constant. It never changes. It will never change if the subnet mask is this 255, 255, 255, 255. 
So if the subnet mask is this, it will never change. <clears throat> okay, so the part that has all ones, when I say all ones, the 255, 255, no, if, if you divide 255 into in a do an LCM, it is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Oh, how many ones is that? Yeah. And then another 245 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, dot, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right. So, do you, do you understand how we arrived at this one? Do you understand how we arrived at this one? The answer is a closed ended question. It's a yes or a no. Guys. So it has a um, couple of ones, and if you count these ones, there are 24 ones inside this, right? So this is 8 plus 8 plus 8, right? So these are how many ones? 24 ones. So 24 bits in the subnet mask are on, rest of them are off. There are total, there are total, total 32 bits in an IPv4 address. Total 32 bits in IPv4 address out of which 24 are on and rest of them which is what like 6 which is 8 is off right so the network part this part is called as a network part that is called as a network part because there are on bits right they are on bits so if this is 0 2 for 5 the subnet mask is 2 for 5 or 2 for 5 or 2 for 5 sorry 2 for 5 2 for 5 0 dot 0 then our this part, <coughs> the third octet will be all zeros. In that case, I will have 16 bits on and 16 bits off. Right? Then, I will have just this part constant. 192, 168, dot 30, dot 1, 30, dot 2, and it may be also 40.1. So, Based on the number of ones, we will decide whether it's a constant or variable like this. The part that is a constant is called as a network ID. The part that is a variable is called as a host ID. Because it keeps on changing between host to host. The IP address that I have here is 43.7. Another device, another laptop in a different room will have 43.8. And the sequence continues till you reach 255. So you cannot have more than, technically it is 253, but then let's still stick around with 255. You cannot give 255 IP address to anybody. 192.168.43.255, technically you cannot give. And people usually do not give dot zero and one to any machine or a device. <clears throat> because one is, um, dedicated to a router like you see here default gateway is 43.1 is assigned to my router so really um, technically you will have 250 um, to 255 minus two IP addresses which is 253 IP addresses which you can have which you can assign in this subnet mask that means you can have 253 machines at your home connected in the same network. Right? You can have 253 machines connected in the same network. Getting it? Getting it? Okay. So, what I want to explain is a concept called as CIDR. Um, <clears throat> what
what is the network part? The network part, like I said, is constant for all the machines. So I'll write the constant part, 192.168.168.30, right, in my case, dot. That is a network ID. The first part is called as a network ID. If you have a subnet mask or like this, 255, 255.0.0.0, then this part will be the network ID. In this case, here, in this case, the network ID is this, right? The host ID is this because the host ID keeps on varying. So when I'm writing a CIDR, I will write the network ID and put a zero next to it and slash, I'll put the number of on bits that are there in the subnet mask. The on bits are 24 in this case, right? So if you tell this that my CIDR is 192.168.30.0, then you can tell a lot of things about it. Number one, that you have 24 on bits, which is 255.255.255.0 is the subnet mask. That is number one that you can tell. Other you can tell is that you will have 253 hosts in your network, right? You can also tell that your network ID is 192.168.30. That's your network ID, right? There's a lot of things that you can tell with this. <clears throat> is this concept clear? Thank you. Now, moving forward. Um, Right. I'm going to give you a small, um, uh, not a homework, but an assignment right now, which do you have to crack this one? So let's say, let's say an IP address, you can put, I'll put the answer in the chat. An IPv4 address is 110.15.99. dot. Forty-five. That's an IPv4 address. Then you also have a subnet mask of 255.0.0.0. Okay. Give me a CIDR. What is a CIDR? Please put your answer in the chat or if you want to ask any question, you can speak up or say something. Eight, what is, what is eight? Eight is a number of on bits, but I want to know what is a CIDR. So the way you write the CIDR is, you write the network part, identify the network part first, yes. So you write 10, and once you identify the network part, you put the rest of them as zeros, right? And then do a slash and then type the number of on bits. So that will be the CIDR notation. <coughs> Okay, that's how it is. Any questions? Uh, Anand, so why don't, uh, I mean, is this the right time to tell you like IPv6? So we want to know about IPv6 also. Like uh, this is a 32-bit version, right, IPv4, and many of the networking on things, I mean, they are still using the IPv4, but we want to know the concept of IPv6 also. IPv4 has 32 bits, IPv6 yep. has 64, sorry, 128 bits. 128 so, bit, yeah. yeah it, has a, it has a 128 bit address, so it has a combination of 
um, alphabets and numbers. And when I say it's alphabets and numbers, it doesn't go from A to Z. It goes from um, A till F only. So IPv4 uh, can accommodate so many addresses here. In this case, if you have a subnet mask of if you have a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, it is accommodating how many hosts? 253 hosts, right? But if you give a subnet mask, just change subnet mask from 255.255.0.0, it can host approximately, what I remember, 65,000 hosts, right? And if the subnet mask goes like this, 255.0.0.0, I'm not sure it, it, it's gonna be a, a much larger number right but these IP address space is not enough and that's when IPv6 came into picture and said that okay instead of having uh, a 32 bit addressing let's do 128 bit addressing where you will have a combination of alphabets and numbers yeah so <clears throat> that way you will have a lot more addresses. You will have a lot more addresses than just um, what IPv4 provides you. So IPv6 has a much larger address space than IPv4 and it is much flexible as well. It is highly secure as well. To secure your network you earlier used to have um, IP uh, I, I, IP security in place but now with IPv6 it has an inbuilt um, um, security so I see this is uh, a no, no, that, that, that's not right. So for this, 10.5.10.5.80.23, if the subnet mask is this, for this the CIDR is not that. That is because the, you need to understand the subnet mask as well. So if you, this part is right, 16 is correct, but this part is not right because you have 16 bits on, so you pick up the network ID. Network ID in this case is 10.15. Why this part is network ID? That is because the number of on bits are here. So you need to pick up the exact network ID here which is 10.15. So that will be your CIDR in that case. Good. 10.15 will be the network ID. So you have to first pick up the network ID and then also pick up the host ID, put them at 00. Right. <clears throat> now one quick question is that 192.168.0.0 slash 16. Okay. That is one subnet mask. And you'll have so many machines inside this, lots of hosts, right? 192.168.30.0 slash 24. Which one is bigger? Which one is larger? Six, 16 is larger, right? Yes, 16 is larger. Does that mean that 192.168.30.0 network, this network, network B, and network A. Okay. If I say network B is a subset of network A, is that right? If I say network B is subset of network A, is that right thing to say? So that is your 192.168.0.0 slash 16 and if I do this and say that 
192.168.0.24 resides inside 192.168.0.16. Is it the right thing to say? Yes. Yes. Everybody agrees to this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all these IP addresses 192.168. No, starting from one to one. Oh, this is a slash. Okay. <clears throat> starting from 192.168.1.0 slash 24, 2.0 slash 24, 3.0 slash 24, and every other IP address will be inside 192.168.0.0 slash 16 because that is a much wider network. Inside that you have smaller networks. So you can have smaller networks within the larger networks like this. So this one, let's say it will be 192.168.20 slash 20.0 slash 24. And there will be another one which will be 192.168.15.0 slash 24. Right? Okay. That's good. <clears throat> now, I want to tell about ports and protocols. Right? Ports and... Uh, <clears throat> ports and protocols are certain things that applications use to communicate with each other. I hope you understood this IP address concepts. Uh, Anand. <coughs> yes. Uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. And is, you guys okay? Yeah. Anand, can you explain this? Like IPv6, I didn't get the point in the previously. You gave the explanation, but uh, I got the example. IPv6. Sagar, can you give me this, uh, you separately? I, I'll take that with you separately because it's going to sure. be a very long sure. explanation. Keeping in mind that I have to focus on what is yeah, yeah. required for uh, Amazon Web Services. IPv6 is not required for Amazon Web Services. But I will oh, okay. take that with you separately. But I want to know so a little bit about this thing. So not now. So later we discuss about this stuff. Yeah. Yes, Thank yes. you so much for that. No, no problem. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I really wanted to take that forward. When you actually asked that question, I did it and stopped it because that I'll, I'll take an hour to explain IPv6. <laughs> so. Uh, that's a very lengthy process, Anand, but uh, I want to know, I mean, I have a little bit of uh, confusion about this. Maybe I get a little clarity, then I can, I think, in that way. But anyway, in the cloud environment, uh, I mean, many networking, we are, we are just using IPv4 itself, right? Yes. Uh, they're not using IPv6. Why? Because it's more security and there's a length, I mean, the networking capacity is like more, I guess. Right. So that, that much is not required, I guess, for like a networking and cloud yeah. environment. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, we we really do not need so much of. But um, have you heard of this um, sim called as Geo Sim in India? Yeah. Yeah. They have implemented. They are using this so technology, well. maybe. Yeah. Sorry. They are using this this technology, IPv6 networking and. Yes. Yes. Because they have to reach oh. out, you know, hundreds of IP addresses to everybody. Thousands, thousands, millions of people will use it, and every one guy may have two IP addresses. In that case, they have to give so many. IP addresses. So when when you put that GeoSIM and you do who is who or what is my IP address, I'll get an IPv6 on my phone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, there's a technology. Well, we'll discuss later. Anand, yeah. I don't want to continue with this stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. So what does a port mean? A port. I'm pretty sure you might have gone through something called as port of entry. <laughs> Isn't it? So that is um, a, a gateway, right? That is a point. That is a point to start with, isn't it? Where that that is how you get in to a particular location, right? A port is no different. A port here is an endpoint of communication. So when there are two devices or two networks communicating communicating with each other, a port needs to be open. If the port is closed you will not be able to enter. You can use this same analogy of port of entry is when you get into a country, you need to go through the port of entry and prove yourself who you are 
and show all the document and if everything is right they let you in so port is no different it is the end point of communication in operating system right the every application has its own port there are so many things that we do on the internet HTTP is something that we use so if you if you go to google.com or browse around this you are using a protocol called as HTTPS right if you go through a regular website banking websites will use HTTPS S stands for secure sockets layer <clears throat> S part of it stands for secure sockets layer so this every application will be different you know certain applications will use FTP file transfer protocol to communicate some protocols will communicate on FTPS certain web, now regular websites do not need HTTPS they will simply use HTTP right so port number often used to identify specific services the Microsoft SQL will use 1433 port then there is DNS which will work on uh, DNS works on 53 DHCP is works on port number 67 68 so every application has an, a, a port port number and there are so many ports that you need to there are so many ports that you need to uh, memorize right there's so many ports that you need to memorize and think about <laughs> So uh, another port, if RDP, also called as MSTSC. MSTSC stands for Microsoft Terminal Services Console. RDP stands for Remote Desktop Protocol. This is something that stands for 3389 is a port number. So there is no logic behind it. If you ask me, hey, why DNS is 53 and 54? I will not have any answer for this because that is something that is predefined in the application. And that's the way it's built. That's it. So we have to memorize these numbers and start using them. In, and we will use this when we are launching um, a virtual machine in the cloud. Yeah. If you want to send emails, uh, via Outlook, you, I'm sure you might have used Outlook. So if you want to send emails via Outlook to your Exchange server, you, you will need port number 25 that will use SMTP transaction. Um, there, there are a bunch of ports and protocols. I'll send you a screenshot and put that in put that in the same folder where we have um, the videos, right? The server should be listening on that port. So if I run this command, uh, netstat, netstat is a favorite command for networking people. Netstat, I find A N O B or even A will give me a bunch of uh, lots of information and all these are the ports that it is listening on 135 port 445 port 903 port it's listening on these ports right so a quick question which port number will be go will google be listening on google.com www.google.com which port number is google listening on Okay, that's great. That's great. I just saw the answers. That's nice. HTTPS and all that. But, you know, um, there is um, a, a small scenario where we talk about, um, just delete all of this. Um, that's a, that is Google.com and that's you. That's you sitting with your laptop and you're trying to access Google.com. Then, of course, your firewall need to have port number 80 open right and Google's firewall also needs to have port number 80 open and if I want to check whether Google is listening on port number 80 or not what I will do is I'll do a telnet yeah telnet is a command to check whether ports are open or not I'll do a telnet and do www.google.com and type in the port number that I want to check whether it's listening or not and just say enter that's it I get a blank screen like this and it's a telnet www.google.com 
and because I get a blank screen it means it is connected on port number 80 yeah I can also do port on, on 443 because that is HTTPS port yeah it is also listing on 443 it will not listen on anything else it will not listen on let's say I'll just do uh, telnet to www.google.com on on 3389 it's not gonna work at all okay so telnet is a command it should be working on your machine as well please let me know if it if telnet is not working on your machine your laptop okay that's good so that's how it is with that we can move forward to Amazon Web Services assuming that everybody has got their um, machines so the small thing that I want to show You have seen these slides in the demo, but I want to start from um, like this. Shift F5. Okay, so um, this is the magic quadrant from our favorite company called Gartner that does a lot of research. And what this slide tells me is that Amazon has grown 10 times in the last couple of years and, and is 10 times bigger than rest of their vendors. A lot of these companies, big companies like Zomato, Ola, Paytm, large companies use Amazon Web Services. Large enterprises also use Amazon Web Services like NDTV, Tata Motors, or whatever. Then large organizations like these, Infosys, HCL, Happiest Mind, Sonata, Satyam, all of them use um, Amazon Web Services. There are certain features that I want you to be introduced to is called well, first one is called EC2 EC2 stands for elastic cloud compute so here you will be able to create virtual machines virtual machines are called as instances in the cloud and there are different kinds of instances that you can create based on your requirement so if you want to create a machine which is which needs high graphics or high power then you will use um, GPU enabled if you want a general purpose machine you can pick up a general purpose instance something that that is very high in memory or very much performance optimized as far as memory is concerned you can pick up memory optimized so there are very broad set of families that it has and it has 24 current generation instances, 14 previous generation instance types, right? There are 40 plus compute instance configurations that you can pick up for, from, and Amazon is constantly working on increasing them. So different kinds of configurations are there and you can pick and choose to which one you look for and we'll do one of them today, right? Most of the organizations and individuals pick up on-demand instances because you just pay as you go. It is very low in cost and very flexible. Where the rest of them, um, reserved instances, you have to reserve a machine and you have to at least go for a year term contract with them. You pay a very low upfront fee um, and then that's where you get lot of discount an hourly discount on that so if you want a specific configuration but you do not want to go for on-demand instance because on-demand instance may may be uh, costing a little bit higher that's where you go for a reserved instance and say that okay I'll go for a reserved instance with 16 GB RAM etc and uh, pick that up and commit to them for at least an year if you commit to them for an year then they're gonna give it to you at a lower cost so reserved instances are more about commitment. You got to get let your machines up and running for at least a year. So that's where Amazon will give you discounts on that. Spot instances are, um, I mean, you, you get machines in spot instances if you bid for them. Higher the bid, um, easier are the chances for you to get that kind of machine. 
So you can get large scale machines for cheaper. Security groups are nothing but firewalls where you will open the ports and protocols for communication, right? So in traditional computing, people used to use firewalls, but now we use security groups. Security groups are responsible for opening up the communication channel between two endpoints or two machines or two instances, right? There is something called as TCP and UDP also, I want to explain that. The TCP is called as Transmission Control Protocol, UDP is User Datagram Protocol. Any communication that is happening between two devices must happen on either of these channels, TCP or UDP, right? <laughs> so TCP um, is, is quick, sorry, TCP is a little bit slower than UDP, but it is very much reliable. TCP is reliable communication. So when you are sending a packet of data from one point to another point, then TCP will ensure that the endpoint receives it for sure. Any packet that is dropping in the middle are once again retransmitted. So that's the job of TCP. UDP doesn't care about the packets that are dropped. It takes the packets and then just delivers it to the destination. If the packets that are dropped in the middle, UDP doesn't care about them at all. So that way UDP is faster. TCP is a little bit slower but more reliable. A lot of communications today use TCP. But then even most critical systems like authentication systems that you do on your machine, control, all, delete, user ID and password, that is using UDP. But, but the you know, internet transactions that we are doing uh, using HTTP transactions, HTTPS things, online transactions that you do, all of them are been done on TCP because that is more connection oriented. Packets that drop in the middle will be retransmitted again. So for every protocol you need to mention whether you are want to open TCP or UDP. Okay. EBS is elastic block storage. Um, so let's say you want to uh, create a machine of about, uh, let's say, 1 GB of RAM, a very basic machine, 1 GB of RAM, and 30 GB of hard drive. That's good. Once you have created that, you will be able to use it. Um, but moving forward, you, the, the storage that is assigned to that machine, 30 GB, may not be sufficient. You may want to add additional hard drives to it. That's when elastic block store comes up and comes into picture and say that you can create volumes in elastic block storage and attach those volumes to your machines on the fly right you can create those volumes in elastic block storage and each volume can be between 1 GB to 16 terabytes in size so it's about attaching a volume to your disk to your instance because your 30 JB default uh, hard disk size is not sufficient. Is that clear so far? Everybody? Anand, we can say it like uh, external hard disk, right? Um, external hard disk, yes. Even this is detachable and attachable. You can detach it and even attach it to a different machine, right? Uh, this is more secure. You can even encrypt this hard disk, this, this, this elastic block storage. You can encrypt that. Yeah, we have the futures. Yeah. S3. Okay. S3 stands for Simple Storage Services and um, it is mostly used for storing your information. This is not used for attaching your hard disk, it cannot be used to do that. But it can be used for a couple of reasons like storing your uh, personal photographs, videos. If you have a website, you can host it in S3. 
things like that so they are accessible via internet as well if you want to act, be accessible over the internet then yes it can be like your google drive it's more like google drive or sky drive where you can upload and download your data so s3 simple storage services and there is no limit to what you can upload here unlimited storage is what amazon gives you but each size the file size cannot be more than 5 terabytes. The size of the file is up to 5 terabytes. Mostly used for uploading information, downloading information, temporary data, uh, websites creation. If you want to host all your websites here, yes, you can host it there. So the last line that you see, web content hosting, serves content as a website with built-in page handling. Okay. Next one is Glacier, another storage concept. So all of these are storage itself. Storage, EBS is storage, S3 is storage, Glacier is storage, but different kinds of storage. Uh, this storage is very low in cost, but mostly used for backups and archives. If you want to back up your data, that is the best place. So every time you take a snapshot of your machine or try to backup, it's going to go in Glacier. So as you see, the cost is less than a cent, one-tenth of a cent per GB per month, right, okay, networking, Amazon calls it as VPC, it is called as virtual private cloud, so this is where you can create the, your entire data center. You can create multiple subnets, you can create the whole CIDR blocks that I was talking about. So you can create multiple virtual machines and different subnets, right? We'll, we'll have that um, as part of the lab. Right, we'll, we'll get to use, use to all of those components. I'll stop the slide for now because we are talking about VPC, that's an advanced concept. We'll talk about that later on. But now I will log into my AWS and click into EC2. <coughs> um, are you share, sharing something? Yes. Do you see my screen? No. Oh. Nobody can see my screen. Sagar, can you see my screen? I'm able to see your screen. Okay. Um, even in my case, it says uh, the screen is shared. Who is not able to see Shanti or Shilpa? I can able to see the screen. Okay. Even I can see it, sir. It's good. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'll quickly uh, create an instance. The way I do it is, you know, I'll, I log into my AWS, then click on EC2. So every time I want to create a virtual machine, I have to go to EC2 because EC2 is place where I can host all my instances, host all my virtual machines. So it gives me a screen. Okay, I'm going to close all of this. On the top right hand side here, it's going to give you a name give you the name which lets you log in and also the list of data centers that you have so you can create a machine in Ohio, North California, wherever yeah you can, you can create wherever now they have a latest place in Mumbai as well so let's say you want to create in North Virginia you can I'll just leave it the way it is and and click on launch an instance okay here it's going to give you a menu of the operating systems. It's going to give you a menu of the operating system so you can choose, pick and choose what operating system you want. Do you want a Linux? If you want a Linux, do you want a customized Amazon Linux? And what does this image have? The image has Python, Ruby, Perl, Java, AWS platforms. It also has Docker, PHP, MySQL, Postgres, a lot of things. So there's a lot of things inside that. What, I'm, what I want to tell you is that you will also get a brief description next to the instance. Right? 
and every image also has an instance ID. This is unique. This is totally unique for every image. I'm calling it as an image because it's more like a photograph. It's, it's captured from a particular pla platform and then kept here so that when you deploy an operating system, it will be picking up from that image. We use AWS EC2 to create virtual machines in the cloud. If you want to create virtual machines, you will be using EC2. <clears throat> right, so I'll move forward and let's say I want to create a basic virtual machine, right? Sagar, you're comfortable with Linux, so maybe you will go forward with Linux, but here for demonstration purposes, I'll use a Windows. Um, so I'll use a Windows 2016 base, right? Now, as you see, some of them have a free tier eligible, and as you scroll down, some of them do not, right? Now, we, not we are, mine is a paid account because I'm done with my free tier. I created my account four and a half years ago, so I don't, I'm not eligible for free tier anymore. But for you, make sure that you select anything that is free tier, right? Or Amazon has given us you know, nice feature here. You just check this box, which will give only free tier uh, machines to you, right? So select that and say select Windows Server 2016 base, right? Now, <clears throat> Remember in one of the screens I was talking about general purpose, memory optimized, compute optimized, GPU compute, this is what I was talking about. So you can pick and choose what you want here. You want a compute optimized machine, you want a memory optimized machine, or you want a general purpose machine, it's on the top here, right? But none of them are free except this one, the one that is written as T2 Micro, right? You want T2 Nano with 1 GB, uh, 0.5, GB of RAM and one CPU is chargeable except this, right? So make sure that you select that one. If you scroll down, there are a lot of things to explore here. So this machine specifically gives you one CPU, one GB of RAM. It has storage on EBS, which is elastic block storage, right? Performance is low to moderate. So if you want very high performance, you can scroll down and pick up the ones that says high, yeah? Good, or you can also select these, you know, instead of scrolling down, you can simply select this and uh, that way you're filtering. These are just filtering options. Okay. Okay, when I hit on next, it's more of the networking concepts. For now, I suggest that you leave it by default, leave it to default and don't hit any of those things. Yeah, just leave it to default because this is a VPC concept. We'll talk about that when we're talking about VPC. Do you want to add more storage to it? By default, it is giving 3 GB in, uh, 30 GB in this image. You can add more volume to it, right? Like additional, this is like a C drive. You can have more drives, D drive, E drive, etc. So remember I was talking about EBS. So it is picking up and storage from EBS. So your volume will be stored in EBS volume. And then by default, it gives eight. If you want more GB, or more, more size attached to that particular volume, you can give that here, 150 GB. But remember that if you use that, being a free tier account, free tier customers um, will not be eligible to add this. Of course, you can add it, but um, you'll be charged for that, right? As well, close it. <coughs> so you can select whether you want a magnetic disk or an SSD. Magnetic disk or whatever. The, the performance on magnetic disk is very low, but SSD is a little bit faster, right? So you hit say add tags, and here I'll say the name is test machine, uh, security groups. So remember I was talking about security groups where you have to open firewalls, and what is the port number for RDP, remotely accessing the, a Windows machine? It is 3389. MSTSC, RDP, port is 3389, right? So when you're writing a rule, when you're writing a rule, when you're writing a rule in the firewall, you have to write the following, source, destination, right, protocol, 
or protocol port number and whether you want to allow whether you want to allow or deny it, which is the status in my case the source is from the internet because I want to access this machine from the internet right that is internet destination is my virtual machine that I am creating protocol is 3389 because in order to RDP I need to have port number 3389 port number or protocol protocol is TCP and port number is 3389 and standard is allowed so if I want to access my virtual machine from the internet I need to have TCP 3389 as allowed that is exactly when I will be able to RDP without which I will not be able to RDP or even do MSTSC I cannot access that so that is a rule that is written here <coughs> right so anywhere 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0 slash 0 it means from anywhere right this one 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, 0 equals anywhere or from internet or intranet right are we clear so far? In real time, would you choose um, AWS according by requirement? Yeah, the clients will give you the requirements. Your clients will give you the requirement, hey, create a virtual machine for me. And also you will get the requirements. Um, that you want a 30 GB disk with 4 GB RAM or 8 GB RAM what port needs to be open all of them the client will give you and you have to open accordingly yeah so when you hit review and launch it's going to give you a summary of what you selected right it's going to give you a summary of what you selected all of that and once you're ready click on launch this is very important here key pairs key pairs are very important because your virtual machine be created will be created by the Amazon but what is the password right what is the password you don't have the password right now this is where you this with the help of key pair you will be able to decrypt the password it doesn't give you the password right on the screen at this time right so let's say I'll create a new pair and give it a name and say test lab uh, say team test lab, whatever yeah and download the key pair now you have to keep this key very safely right this this file team test lab dot pam it has to be kept very safely because once you have downloaded it you can never ever download it again so either you keep the password safely or keep the pem file it's called as a pem file pem yeah it's a private key it's written here you have to download the private key file before you continue store it in a secure and accessible location you will not be able to download the file again after it is created so once it is created you can never ever download it again so make sure that you have to save this file safely in a place otherwise you will never be able to log into the machine provided you reset the password I'll tell you the ways I'll click on launch instances it's going to take a while to get the machine going up and running that's it so it says your instance is now launching I'll click on this I0 whatever and it will take me to EC2 right it is pending now so I'm creating a virtual machine in North Virginia region and so it already it already got a private IP that's the name that's the instant instance ID instant ID instance ID is very unique oh I selected a m4 x2 large Wow <laughs> it's a big machine <clears throat> should have selected a t2 micro never mind <clears throat> so I'm creating it in availability zone called East 1c now regions and availability zones are different North Virginia is a region within this region you will have availability zone right so let's say this one this is a region and you call it whatever region yeah let's call it 
Ohio. Within this region, what you will have is something like availability zones. We also call them as AZs. AZs or availability zones are totally isolated networks. They are connected between each other with very low latency links, very low latency links. So they are isolated. So if you are hosting an application over here and another application over here, right, or maybe similar application here, if this goes down, your application is still accessible in another AZ, availability zone. So availability zones are represented like this, US East hyphen 1C. They will have A, B, C, D, that is the naming convention. Clear? Team, is it clear so far? Okay. Okay. Shilpa, is it clear? No, sir. Once again, please. Okay. So, these are all data centers, massive data centers. Look at North Virginia. These are all massive data centers. Each of those data centers are called as regions. Each region, each region will have their own availability zones. Right? Availability zones are totally isolated and they are named as A, B, C, D. So, you for this, it's mostly for redundancy purposes. So, if you are this zone is gone, you can continue to access the application from here. So you need to host your application in multiple availability zones so that it's mostly for redundancy, like I said, a backup place. So if this goes down, you can always access it from another location. And they are called as availability zones. A region is like a massive region like this, North America, and uh, that region will have a, a smaller availability zones. These are also data centers. Good? Yes, sir. Thank you. So this machine is on its way. That's availability zone. The status is running, but that, that does not mean that I can access it because status checks is still initializing. I need to see two by two checks over here. That is a public DNS. So if I want to access it publicly, I should be able to access it with this. That is a public IP address. Did you do homework on public IP and private IP? What a public IP is, what a private IP is. Private IP is something that is accessible internally. Public IP can be accessed from external world as well. So if you look at this, I click on it and this machine has a public IP. It also has a private IP, see? This is a private IP and this is a public IP, right? It has a public DNS name as well. So a couple of homeworks were, were given to you last time to see what is a public IP, what is a private IP, what is DNS, what is DHCP, all of that is something that you need to understand. Class A, comma, class B, class C, loop back, IP address which started with 127 dot whatever 0 dot 0 dot 1, yeah. So keep reading, keep researching. You need to know all of this. You need to know. So yeah, so it's launch time was this. It's in this so and so security launch wizard. That's the VPC ID is subnet mask, etc. So I've picked up this one, Windows 2016 machine. Key pair that I use is Team Test Lab. You can never download this key pair, key pair again. The owner is my ID. Right, this is um, launch time was December. Okay, so you'll see a lot of these attributes that are linked up to to that virtual machine over there. You can use these buttons to move this up and down. So if there are more virtual machines, you may need this box. Yeah, status text is more of more from the from the alerting and alarm monitoring system. Monitoring will let you know the number of disk operations, the network IOPS, it will draw graphs out there to tell you the performance of each of those parameters. Right? Don't create large instances like this. That was a mistake, but you create uh, production environments will do it, but uh, they will be charged for it. Since you have a free tier account, Create only 
smaller ones, T2 micro instances. Okay, so now I'll pick up this one. Um, I'll pick up the public IP address because I'm on the internet and I want to access this. And I'll use MS, MSTSC to connect to that. And let's see if it lets me connect. I just pasted the IP address over there. And wow, it is asking me for user ID and password. Okay, I type the user ID which is administrator. And the password is something that I need to pick up from here. So right click and say get Windows password. And I point it to the file that we you know, used it earlier. What was the name of the file? Team, team something, right? So it's team and say decrypt. And that's it. This is your password. Will you be able to remember that? <laughs> <clears throat> not in the lifetime so control C and that's where it says that we recommend that you change your default password if the default password is changed it cannot be retrieved through this tool again right you have to change this password and how do you change this password is something I'm going to show you once we log in say okay <clears throat> that's it you're ready to go rock and roll let's log into that <clears throat> That's it. So your Windows 6 2016 machines is all set. That's it. So welcome to 2016. That's your first instance in Amazon Web Services. It's good. So once you're logged in, just go to compmgmt.msc and hit enter. That will take you to computer management. I'm not sure how you do that in Linux. Oh, in Linux is the uh, PRT conf. It shows the configuration of all the, I mean, server details. It gives all the server details. Which one? PRT conf. Normally, you are checking the system right. variables and what are the things, right? Right. Yeah, we use the PRT conf. It's the server model number and how much RAM, how much size. And all those details will give. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's good. So um so you go to computer management, expand local use in group, click on users, right click and say set password. And that's it. You change this password to whatever you want. That's it. Password has been set. So now you do not have to depend on that file. You do not ever have to depend on this file that you downloaded. Right? If you do not reset it. That's when you will have to depend on that. Let's see what's the configuration that it gave. <clears throat> okay. Oh, wow. I've got 32 GB RAM. 32 GB RAM, 64-bit machine. This is amazing. So what I will be doing right now is shut this down immediately so that my credit card will not be bounced. I hope you understand what I'm doing, right? Everybody. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'll click on instant state and say terminate. Stop will shut it down. Reboot will restart. Terminate will get this machine out of my, um, you know, data center totally. So to shut this down, and that's it. So give that a shot. Give it a try on your uh, accounts. And if you any 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 questions so far, my future cloud aspirants, this is the time.
No questions? Uh, Anand, so what are no, the port numbers? I'm sorry. Can I? Go yeah, my question is Anand. Yeah. Yeah, so what are the ports mainly used in the AWS? Like you're working on the real time environment. What are the main ports we, we need to concentrate? Like Telnet we normally use, right? You will need DNS. 53, you'll need DHCP, 67, 68, you'll need RDP, 3389, what's it, SSH, you'll need 22. If you have SQL, then you will need 1433. Then if you need uh, uh, PostgreSQL, then you will need 54321. So basically what I'm trying to say is, depends on the application that it is hosting. If you're hosting a web server, you will use port number 80 and 443. If you're in a database, then you will use one of those. If it is a DNS server, 53, RDP, 3389. So it depends on the application that is hosted on the machine that you're creating. Getting it right? Yeah. It all depends on what application it is. If, or if you have a customized application, let's say you have an LDAP, open LDAP, right? LDAP, LDAP will use 389. And if that also has a global catalog, then it will use 3268. So if it is LDAP S, um, 636. And you can just continue to write down all these ports here. I have the list of... Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, at, at least we should remember the well-known ports like this because they are you often asked in the interviews as well. So it's, it will be great to have those in mind. <laughs> okay. I have some of these. Uh, I don't remember, but okay, we can get it. I guess through a. So internet, the so mainly used port numbers. I have, um, I have it. Yeah, the four point. Yeah, I, I had a slide on uh, slide on the ports and protocols. No, it's not here. Okay. That's it. So I'm going to put this in right. I'll save it. Stop. Okay. I'll put that in the drive. What was the name? Ports. Ha! Huh. I forgot the name. Ports and protocols. Okay, 
So it's uploaded to the drive. You should be able to access it now. That is a bunch of ports that you will need it. Okay. Any questions, guys? Okay, get those things going um, and memorize about the ports and protocols and uh, <clears throat> go through all those videos one more time. Get your basics and fundamentals strong so that you will be able to understand the next set of complex topics that we'll be talking in the next set of classes. All right. All right, we're done for the class. I'll leave the session open for another five minutes and, um, and then you can drop off if you like but if you want to ask any questions I'm open for another five minutes uh, hi Anand this is Shanti uh, last a few classes I missed so uh, four classes I missed yes okay so uh, was it, was it sorry Yes, yes. I, I'll, I'll share the videos with you. Uh, have you okay. Ready? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sagar, you got any questions? Mm, I'm good, Anand. Actually, I have the advanced concept in the uh, LDAP integration. So we talked about in when you are working on the IAM. Mm -hmm. So I, okay. Yeah. Uh, in the IAM time, the the LDAP comes into the IAM, right? It's a application process and all. LDAP integration with um, IAM in Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, does the, I mean, have we created LDAP authentication in the AWS? I mean, real-time environment, like what we need to take care before doing that? Uh, work, uh, I've done that in Azure. I've done that in Azure, Azure. in uh, AWS. Okay. But, uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, not only like Windows servers, we need to take the Amazon, uh, Amazon or Linux servers when you're creating the instances. Why? Because when you enter into the real-time environment, we are not sure like what servers we need to pick up. Based on the application level, we need to work on the Linux also. Right. So, uh, shall we take some some of the Linux servers when you are working on that? When you are like, creating instances, like we are doing uh, with security first. You got my question. You're saying that we should be creating some Linux instances as well? Yeah. So uh, Sagar, it's more about uh, giving you an overview of Amazon Web Services. It could be Windows or it could be Linux. The concepts of AWS do not change. It's just the okay. way you connect. It's just the way you connect to the machines. I'm using RDP in in Windows. You may use Putty, a Putty session, and then do do a yeah, SSH over Telnet. So it doesn't matter whether we are using a Linux machine or a Windows machine. My objective of giving an AWS session is to give you concepts about EC2, S3, load balancing and those features that, are, that AWS is giving you. Creating what kind of instance, I mean it's, it's all up to you as to how much of R&D that you can do. If I start creating instances on Windows and then Linux, it's going to be a forever class, right? So I, I, I suggest that if you want to do certain certain things that you can do outside uh, those things um, and, and, and do the R&D. But um, definitely we, we will be able to discuss and share those things. But the agenda of the session will be to let you know, make you aware of what, what features AWS is providing. Okay, then it's not, uh, I mean... Uh, it's not consideration which operating system we are using. Anything is fine, right? Yes, anything is fine. Now the client. Yeah, so Windows is fine. And so your client may dictate what operating system um, you you are using. 
so like a normal normal system admin we, we don't open the console and we don't need to type any commands it's like uh, what uh, i mean is aws is like we are not working with the console right we are not typing any commands it's directly gui right oh you you can do it with console as well you, you, oh. you, know, you, you can do it with command line as well like here i don't have to log in i just say aws ec2 describe hyphen instances and it's going to give me all the instances that are there in that particular region and the reason why it's, it will be able to give me is because i've already configured my machine with my user id and password and the instance that i should be doing so this is a default thing i've already configured it oh okay yeah i i, I never ever have to log into the aws uh, gui I, i never have to log in nobody has to ever log in so you can just do it with command line so your manager says that okay create a vm for me in aws you can do it with command line aws hyphen ec2 hyphen run uh, sorry ec2 hyphen what is it called run hyphen instances and then you say help it's going to give you a bunch of commands that you can run with it so never have to log into that at all okay this one this command launches the specified number of instances using an ami so there are a bunch of syntaxes that you can use yeah <laughs> okay so we can work like this yeah and normally so uh, yeah we, so i'm using one site uh, anand this udemy the software like we are we are learning course from online it's completely there it's explaining i mean this is just we uh, have the idea about you are providing to... some online training yeah okay do, do you have idea about this one you tell me yeah i know you tell me okay yeah uh, in this uh, uh, they are working completely on gui they didn't open any console so that's why i got a question is, is that completely gui or like so we can work through command line also you can work with powershell you can work with python you can work with c plus you, you can you, you you can work with any language that you know it doesn't have to be gui like i just showed you right i just showed you you can work with yeah yeah i got it you know yeah okay <clears throat> we will do that i'll do one oh. class specifically on, on on the command line only but only once we are done with the agenda uh, i'll i'll get that done for you sagar for everybody when once everybody is comfortable with aws i'll tell you how to auto yeah, yeah. write scripts as well so don't worry about that yeah okay in the aws uh this is also important a docker installation is that also uh, is the part of aws it's part of aws but not part of aws administration that's part of aws development oh okay devops so this it comes into the development right devops oh. but the uh, scripting is involved into the uh, administration administrator role right yes what well, is important task so I need to. We need to work on the scripting also, right? Yes, yes. Like I said, initially uh, to start, you may not need it, but moving forward, you will need it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, Anand. So I got a clear explanation about this. Yeah, Great. Thank you so much. So Shilpa had a question. Um, so I, I I didn't actually get it. Can we open the virtual machine you created with your user ID and password? So. I didn't get that actually. I didn't understand. Can you please repeat it or maybe unmute and ask? So the one you have created and deleted just now, can we? use by us with your id and password uh my machine is gone that that machine is deleted it, it is terminated it's gone so if it is not deleted if it is not deleted can we use yes yes absolutely absolutely oh, okay yeah if if i give you the public ip 
if i give you the public ip user id and password then yes yeah, because i have opened the port from the internet 0000/0 yes you can okay okay thank you no problem anybody can access it you create a machine give me the public ip user id and password that's it i mean okay <coughs> okay guys we'll see for look forward for another exciting session tomorrow at the same time i'll have the webex sessions rolled out soon thank you everyone thank you sir good day thank you bye Thank you.